Welcome to Ed Talks. My name is Janae Nugent. I'm a Board of Governors Teaching Chair at the University of Lethbridge. We are guests here on Blackfoot land. Uh, and in recognition and appreciation of that, I would like to uh, say Oki Nitsu Kawawa. Welcome to our friends and relatives. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce today Roy Pogorzalski, who is the Director of Indigenous Student Affairs at the University of Lethbridge. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us yeah. today. Thanks for having me, Janae. This is excellent. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy to be here. Great. So I like to start off my interviews by asking people uh, to uh, get to let us get to know you a little bit and tell us about you know your journey, your teaching journey, your education journey, uh, and how you wound up here at the University of Lethbridge. Oh wow! Okay, that's an excellent question. Well, well, my background's Métis uh, from Northern Saskatchewan, a very traditional family, um, very strong genealogy ties in that area, and when I was. Uh, when I was growing up, I grew up in Regina, Saskatchewan, and when I was growing up, my, a lot of my family hadn't had the opportunity to go to, let alone post-secondary education, or not post-secondary, but like secondary education, let alone post-secondary education. Right. So even high school was, was quite an accomplishment just because of uh, the systems that were in play for Métis people uh, during a lot of this time, right? And so when I was growing up, it was kind of different. When I was in high school, a lot of people tried to steer me towards the trades. Mm. You know, they were like, you'd make a great trades person. You know, my dad had a great job at the steel mill. And I remember being in high school and just thinking maybe, you know, that was the route that I should take. And I had one uh, high school teacher uh, who was kind of a mentor to me said, you know, you can do more than this if you want to. You don't have to go into the trades. You can go into university. You can give it a try. Um, and so I went into the pre-police studies program at the University of Regina. Ah. And when I was registering, it's kind of funny, uh, my dad came and picked me up and took me down there to register for my courses and I had no idea what to take. Um, so I took astronomy because I thought looking at the stars would be fun. Right. Uh, I did no that one told, same thing. Yeah. I did that exact same thing. <laughs> yeah. No one told me physics was involved in yeah. astronomy at this time. So uh, that was a real culture <laughs> shock in my first semester. You know, I took the basic English, math, and then I took women's studies uh, my yeah. first semester, which was kind of uh, unique. And I chose these courses and I took them and uh, things got challenging. You know, I wasn't prepared. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There wasn't a lot of... Um, indigenous supports at the time because the First Nations University of Canada hadn't been created. Mm. It was a Saskatchewan Indian Federated College which was kind of a small little trailer park off of College West at the University of Regina. Mm. And there wasn't a lot of supports for Indigenous students at this time. So I didn't have a lot of those cultural supports to lean on. So it was kind of figure it out and, and be resilient. But I, I met some great people along my path who mentored, coached me, and, and I was able to complete uh, two bachelor degrees from the University of Regina, and you know, one with distinction, which was quite exciting. Right. And uh, from there, my, my story, I worked at the University of Vienna in Austria for an internship, and then I went and did my master's um, in Belgium at the Catholic University of Leuven. <laughs> and I got there because I was chasing love. I fell in love with a <laughs> Flemish girl. <laughs> So, you know, I, I applied for this amazing <laughs> program, but I was I was chasing love for sure. Uh, but I got a great degree out of it. What's uh, your master's degree in? It's in cultures and development studies. Oh, okay. um, it's an advanced master's program out of the Catholic University of Leuven. And when I moved back, I moved here to Blackfoot Territory in 2009 for the first time. Oh. And I started as an Aboriginal diversity support coordinator for a small nonprofit, Aboriginal Council of Lethbridge at the time. And, you know, I'll just fast forward a bit to my connection to the U of L. You know, I've always loved academia. I love campus life. I love uh, programming on campuses. I love being in front of students or mentoring students. Uh, so when I got here, uh, when I arrived back in 2013, I went to Belgium again. I immigrated there. Uh, to try to get married and try is the imperative word because right. yada 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 i'm back in canada <laughs> right but, but when i came back to the campus here it was really interesting because i joined the university of lethbridge senate uh, oh. about four years ago now and that was really my first kind of strong connection and then shortly after i started a uh, sessional instructing in management the Canadian Culture and Management course to the international exchange students. Oh, cool! Yeah, Andre mm -hmm. Andrea Amelings gave me the, a real opportunity there, and I've been I'm still instructing that course. And then just this past last year, I got um, on as the director of Egaskini, um, mm -hmm. the gathering space, um, and uh, and director of Indigenous Student Affairs, and it has just been amazing. And and even back then, I even um, chaired the students' union for two years. Oh, right. <laughs> 
<laughs> a few years ago, which was an amazing experience. I met some really amazing, like, young leaders right. who I'm still friends with today. A lot of these um, that were on the executive and the general assembly. And man, what an amazing, amazing opportunity to, to see the inner workings of student politics. Right. <laughs> wow. And here I am. I'm on, I'm on the University of Lethbridge campus. Oh, that's awesome. And so in your roles as both the director of Indigenous Student Affairs and a guest kinney, um, what do you do? Like what, what sort of your main mandates or, you know, a life, a day in your life? No, that's <laughs> a really uh, good question. Important question, too. You know, now, you know, with, with the TRC calls to action coming out, the Truth and Reconciliation calls to action, um, there's been a large emphasis around reconciliation, um, and there's been a lot of cross-collaboration with faculty and departments. You know, it's amazing now because I see a lot of faculty members uh, starting to utilize territorial acknowledgements on their syllabi and also in their classrooms and explaining uh, what exactly, why it's important to do that. Um, those are really important things. So I've been collaborating a lot with faculty to look at, you know, we use this term, and I'm going to use it loosely, indigenizing curriculum. Mm -hmm. You've heard that term, and I think yeah. people get stuck on it. Right. I don't think they realize that the small steps they're taking, like territorial acknowledgments, like creating a safe and welcoming, inclusive space for students to learn, is, is already doing that. Um, it's part of that. And I think the same goes with reconciliation. I think a lot of people get stuck on the term and they and they, they don't know exactly how to proceed. Right. Um, because there's a large history there that has to be unpacked. And right. there's a lot of truth that has to be unpacked. Um, so, and learned. <laughs> yeah, and learned, absolutely. Yeah. And so one of the, the biggest proponents has been, you know, changing the conversation with different faculties or different departments and administration and so forth that to say we are doing this work, small steps are doing this work, and we just have to continue to build relationships, we have to continue to educate, build awareness and understanding, and that is doing this work. Right. You yeah. know, so Dr. Leroy Little Bear would say we've been doing this work ever since Native American Studies uh, a degree came in in like 1975. Right. Right, when he helped create that, we've been doing this work um, it was the university's, you know, connection to the Blackfoot people saying we will offer a degree program um, at that time. So I think a lot of it comes to telling our story. So with my day to day, we have a, a, an academic advisor, we have a program specialist, and we have our admin support. So on a day to day basis, we're doing we're running programs out of Egaskini for our students, programs that are going to give them tangible life skills, but also elders talking circles, connecting with our with our elder, on-campus elders, but also bringing in other elders. You know, we've really been busy with cha changes to convocation where indigenous graduates can now wear across um, their cultural regalia in place of the traditional cap and gown. But they can also, they also get a stole that shows the inclusivity of indigeneity on our campus. There's also indigenous food on the track, which was kind of cool. There was berry soup up there oh. for all graduates and their family oh, to this enjoy. Oh, this summer? So, yeah, this past summer. And I wasn't and, there. I, I, was, I was way, but yeah. Yeah, and it was amazing. People grabbed it. Uh, you know, we're looking at asset mapping on campus where we where we do an inventory of some of the research that's going on, some of the policies, procedures, programming, so that we can uh, collaborate more on such important initiatives, especially in research. And there's the Indigenous strategy. Our university is gearing itself towards creating an Indigenous strategy that really amalgamates all these facets of pro procedures, programs, you know, research and all these things into one document for campus. And I think that's a huge undertaking. And I think with something like that, it'll really allow a greater connection and engagement to other faculties and staff. And then, of course, we meet with our students and support our students in, in anything that they need support in. Right. I mean, that's, that's taking a lot <laughs> on. It's a huge job. There's so, so many facets to it. Uh, and you have your amazing staff in, uh, yeah. that, that help you through working with the students um, in particular, but they're also helping you with some of the larger university initiatives. Who's involved in the larger university initiatives? Like, where's the, the drive coming from? Who's um, consulted? Who are the, mm. you know, the the word is always stakeholders, right? Like who's involved in the process? That's a really good question. Well, we yeah. do have an Aniskim Education Committee okay. that reports to General Faculties Council. Now this committee has a lot of uh, strong knowledge keepers on the committee that really assist and guide this committee in its work. 
you know, there could be recommendations or there could be, you know, support on working groups or, or subsets of that. Um, as well as a lot of our elders and like the community is a large key stakeholder, right? We have right. a couple of uh, pretty important community members that sit on that committee and we're also tied into Reconciliation Lethbridge, which takes place in the entire community and is really working. The municipality just gave them money to roll out this work. So educational institutions are very important that the college, the school districts, um, you know, Palliser, school, school District 51, and uh, Holy Spirit, then of course us here at the University of Lethbridge are extremely important to what the municipality does when it comes to reconciliation and being a partner there. So I mean, there, there's a lot of stakeholders that are key to this momentum, but I'd say a lot of faculties too. I've had a lot of faculty members from a cross range of faculties come up and departments come up and have conversations about um, how to how to engage this in the classroom, how to have these conversations, how to be an ally and an advocate on campus for the work that we're trying to do and achieve. And it's been amazing, like even the work we did with the myth and facts uh, that went up last Indigenous Awareness Days, those are so important. Um, and it's just amazing to see that connection and so many uh, faculty members wanting to connect and wanting to collaborate on this work of, you know, and again, this term, there's a better term for it, I'm sure, but like indigenizing a campus yeah. is what people have been kind of saying. And it's really just uh, making a campus, you know, that's welcoming, inclusive and for our indigenous students so that when they come on campus, they are, they have meaningful ways to participate. They feel part of the community uh, or the campus community and they want to engage more and, and do more. And that's why we, we try to connect around campus because we want to reach out and have those connections for our students. Right, right. Yeah. And every faculty and every department will do things differently, right? It just depends on their topic and how it all works. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and that's in terms of the curriculum, but in terms of environment, that's much more sort of, we can all access that. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and yeah. you know, with, with, no, with the topic of reconciliation, you know, that encompasses so much more than just the term itself. And I think mm -hmm. that's where people get stuck on the term and don't know how to proceed. It's right. because it, there's political reconciliation, there's economic reconciliation, there's social reconciliation, there's so many facets to it. There's even, like you said, returning to the physical environment or ecology of where the campus is. Right. And looking at bringing native plants back to campus and working with Blackfoot consultants from the Confederacy consultants from, from the nations to look at how do we bring this back naturally and organically that can be harvested um, in the future and used um, for different purposes. Yeah. So, you know, when we, it's just such an enormous portfolio and that's where we're working with the teaching center and the agility program to try to have a cohort that will bring these native plants to campus. So when it comes to like indigenous affairs on campus, it, it is a very, uh, diverse and large portfolio because it can really reach out to the sciences to to you know anthropology social the arts and science you know management like it's just it crosses all it intersects all the different departments and so it has been just amazing meeting folks and having these type of important discussions I've really enjoyed getting to know you and yeah, I feel I've, you. yeah I feel I've learned so much right and Don McIntyre is another person on campus um, who and Maura Hanrahan, I mean, just yeah. listening to my Indigenous colleagues is so um, enlightening for me. I just, you know, I grew up in Southern Alberta. I grew up right next to, uh, well, not right next, I was in Cold L, but I grew up yeah, yeah, near, yeah. Um, you know, the uh, the Blackfoot peoples and and many in my community. And, and I really feel like I didn't know them at all until I've gotten to know my colleagues really, really well, or like, you know, listening to their stories and, and, and listening to the truths, right? And so that's been a really enlightening experience for me, for sure. Yeah, and I think too, like- um, And I have it, a long way to go. Well, no, and, <laughs> and I think we all do, me too, you know, like we've, we grew up understanding the story of Canada right like in all my classes i knew the story of canada and you know, whether you choose to remember it or not is is yeah. your own choice but i was taught the story of canada i was taught about john a mcdonald and our fathers of confederate not louis riel at this time right because yeah. there was high debate whether he was considered a father of confederation right i learned about everything bad he did yeah. right yeah you know and so um you're, you're growing up learning this story and then on top of it all we homogenize 
indigenous history. Yeah. So, you know, here we are in Blackfoot territory. It's it's Kainai, it's Begani, it's Siksika. You know, it's these stories that are so important to this area. And when we go back home, it's Cree, you know, and, and there, we have for so long homogenized people under the umbrella of Aboriginal that we've mm -hmm. often left out the stories of people. And it's the same as simply labeling Canada as Canadians. We take away the true story of Canadians, whether that be a newcomer who just arrived here three years ago, got their citizenship, or whether it's a family that is six, seven generations here mm -hmm. who have a deep embedded story. Yeah. We can't just say all Canadians. Yeah, or if you're a Maritimer or a... Right. Yeah. The regional differences are yeah. the same for Indigenous people as they are for Canadian provinces. Yeah. So when we talk about regionalism and all that stuff, it's really interesting. We can't say BC is the same as PEI. It's much like we can't say the Blackfoot are the same as the Anishinaabe or the Métis are the same as the you know Salish people. We, right. we just can't. So I think reconciliation, I hate going back, isn't that homogenizing indigenous people. I think rec true reconciliation is looking at the intersectionality. You know, not all indigenous people want to take a sweat. Right. You know, not some indigenous people are Catholic. I mean, it's just a wide <laughs> range of our intersectional identity. And I think we're getting so caught up on the, the homogenizing these terms that we're forgetting that everyone's experience is valid, important, and should be told. And that's the same for all Canadians, right? right? And so, I think that I think that we're at that level where we're starting to understand that, and those stories are coming out more because there's trust, right? Right? Like you talk to Don and Mora and all of our indigenous Michelle. colleagues, yeah, Michelle, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you look at all of our colleagues, and they'll tell you the same thing. It's about trust. You you tell your story when you can trust the people that you're giving your story to, right. and a lot of elders you'll talk to too. They they will give you great stories if they if they trust that you are able to handle the information appropriately right you know? yeah what role do elders play on campus yeah i think elders are extremely important i know for me going to school like i had my elders in my life that i could go home and i had my family and man they were instrumental in telling me stories and keeping me resilient you know because how can you look back and say Oh man, I, I gotta give up. I gotta quit when I hear the stories that my grandma had to go through, or when mm -hmm. the stories that her sisters had to go through, or my great grandma was a midwife in Meadow Lake and delivered most of the oh, babies at that really? time. You know, so I think about myself in a modern context, and I go, there was resilience there. My mom fought hard so that I could have a better opportunity. For me to waste that opportunity, I think, would be disrespectful to to her story and, and to what she went through. And she, I was fortunate enough she shared it with me at a young age, which made me an angry student in post-secondary, <laughs> but, but I had a lot of good mentors that were able to harness my energy right. into doing positive things with it. So our elders, people don't realize just how important elders are for grounding individuals and, and, and preaching that resiliency. You know, I was talking with Dr. Little Bear, and this is a bit interesting. We were on the topic of racism, and I asked him, how was it coming to university in the 70s? Mm -hmm. You know, I, want, I was interested, and, in, you know, he, he sat me down, and, and he was just like, you know, racism's a real part of life. It still is. We can't ignore the fact that, that racism doesn't exist. You know, racism's here. And he goes, so really the important piece is teaching resiliency mm -hmm. in our students because they're going to encounter it. It, it, it's going to happen on campus. So when it does, it shouldn't stop you from getting to your end goals. It shouldn't derail you from doing what you want to do in life. But rather, we should teach resiliency and perseverance and, and know that you can get through this. You will be an activist. You will be a voice. But you have to be able to handle these situations. And I thought it was a very interesting conversation I had with him. And, and it's so true. And I think our elders give that to us. So we have two on-campus elders now who are just unbelievably phenomenal elders in so many ways, uh, Corolla Kafrobe and Francis First Charger, um, whom I've got a really strong personal relationship with. And they're here for students on their times that they're on campus, but now it's great because faculty are bringing in elders to talk in their classrooms. Fa um, we're bringing in elders consultations for our indigenous strategy and to look at how the university should proceed. Um, I think even in the future, it might be kind of neat to see an elder co-teach a class 
Oh, that'd be with, cool. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. As a sessional instructor, not mm -hmm. as like, here, let's pay an honorarium every time you come in, but right. as an actual instructor of a course, because right. I think our Indigenous knowledge has been devalued because of the um, strong emphasis on that piece of paper at the end of the, uh, you know, at the end of right. the journey, that PhD, right. when in our communities, a lot of our elders are the ones who hold all of the knowledge that we would need to to have a good life. Right. And so I think that once our institutions can start to see the real value of the knowledge that they have from a lifetime of learning, and even now the knowledge has been marred by government policy, that they have the, they have the knowledge of teaching resiliency and perseverance and other traits right. that, that, they had to, that they can teach now because of the things they had to endure um, going through their own journeys. Right. Which is really uh, really challenging. So in in my opinion, it is just it's so it's so important to embed that in our institutions. I had the great great honor of uh, having two Buffalo women come to one of my classes, and uh, that was two and a half years ago. And I just got an email a week ago from a student who's um, and a non-indigenous student who said that was the highlight of her university. Uh, experience was getting to listen to them and and hearing their stories and really learning from them and uh, so you know I it's not um, just the indigenous students who learn <laughs> from the elders on campus um, as well as administrators and faculty and everybody is learning from them so of course and you yeah. know one of our one of our mandates at Egeskini is to uh, to be inclusive to all students like you know, indigenous students, yeah, come on down. You know, like our, our staff offer more than just what we can offer you on campus. You know, like I, I currently sit um, as a board of director in the Chamber of Commerce, you know, run a couple businesses in town. And I love to share that knowledge with young business students, yeah. you know, who want to learn and, and who are too scared to make the jump to business. Right. You know, I'm a... Um, I'm You're on the Rotary. R Rotary, yeah. I'm president <laughs> of our Rotary Club this year. And we yeah. have volunteer opportunities so much in the community that... Any students that want to connect, I mean, come have all, you know, pad your CV, like work and <laughs> network. That's what this whole time is really about. Yeah. You know, you learn from your professors, you read literature, you you debate your col your academic colleagues, and then you network, you network, you <laughs> network. Yeah. And when you come out of here, if you've networked well enough, if you've volunteered well enough, if you engage your campus community well enough, and you've even became friends with some professors or some staff on campus, well, men, the sky's the limit on what opportunities you could have coming out of here. Right. Um, and so I try to instill that into a lot of our I Indigenous students is, you know, this moment right now is really important and, and you shouldn't take it for granted because you have the real opportunity to meet so many people. And this community, we're 100,000 people coming on citizens really quickly. And that's important. We're growing. So with growth comes opportunities. And I think, I think that that's where any student can benefit from those tangible skills. And so it doesn't have to be indigenous um, workers only giving information to indigenous students. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Certainly, I think that there's an inclusive, uh, respectful atmosphere there where any student can come to our space and really uh, utilize our services too. Yeah, diversification yeah. goes every which direction. Of course, of <laughs> yeah. course, you know. Yeah. And I love when students come to visit yeah. or partake in our activities or yeah. want to know more, or curious. Yeah. You know, I had a, I spoke in, uh, maybe this is a good segue, but I spoke in uh, Shelley Wismath's class yes. about uh, the Common Book Project, uh, the Education of Algie Marasti. Yeah. Can you explain what that is before you continue on? The Common yeah. Book Project was this um, project where uh, professors would take the book and utilize it in their syllabus and their students would read it and they would have classroom discussion on it. I think there was nine classes in the something beginning like one, that. something like that. And yeah. 800 students were exposed to this literature, right? which and, was the true story. Yeah, and, and part of the um, original philosophy of the Common Book Project was to um, have a common experience, particularly for first year students, mm -hmm. so that they could build community in their first year and have something that they could converse with each other about um, and really engage in. And um, and it was the August, uh, uh, 
Agi Marasti. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And this this story is important because he's from our area. He's from yeah. northern Saskatchewan. You know, Marasti ties into a lot of our Métis families. There's all mm. relations up there. So, right. you know, taking this book into consideration and his story, and just even the story about how the author worked with Augie to get the notes. He lost his notes at times. Like, there was a lot that went into the writing of this book um, and the important message it brings. So when I went into Shelley's class, I talked about... Uh, reconciliation that was kind of the topic of, of what was happening and I, fi I just came off of finishing chairing the um, reconciliation imp implementation plan for the city oh, right. so that document was kind of fresh in my mind with that committee of, of folks and so I went in there and I talked about reconciliation getting involved and I had about four or five students who were generally interested in in doing committee work or volunteering for reconciliation who were just kind of enthralled by reading the book and also they were like how do I get, how do I give back how do I do more uh, and those were a lot of the questions. And I also went into uh, Michael Stingle's uh, philosophy class to right. have a discussion on this as well. And, and again, just great feedback. So the, the Common Book Project, in my opinion, was highly successful. Right. And even now with the bookstore promoting this, this piece of literature, I think that now I, I went and had a meeting with the folks in the registrar's office who are reading that book as a common book project just for their department. Right. And I and I, I see a lot of like great value in that is having students across a wide spectrum be exposed to some um, really important yeah literature that's coming through, whether it be even on discussions on you know citizenship and refugees in Canada or whatever the next book may be. I think that it's uh, they're just such important discussions to have. Right. Can you just talk about what the book is about just a little bit? <laughs> yeah, so the, well the book is really capturing like Augie Morasti's story. You know the cover it has like a mitten on it and that's the story of a time where he lost his mitten in northern Saskatchewan and he was out trying to and he couldn't come in until he found it mm -hmm. and he couldn't find the mitten so he was beaten for that and th that's just one of many many stories of this nature um, but he lived on the streets on and off in Prince Albert and, and he had this little shack up in, in the north and he was uh, he just decided one day he kept, he, to write a book you know <laughs> and not okay. really write the book more so he connected I believe with the U of S with the author that, that wrote the book and, and he was just like I've got a story or there was a transcript or it somehow got to this author and he worked with uh, Augie Marasti to get the story uh, down Right. And that's kind of, so it, it details his, his experience in those schools. Right. It's like Maria Campbell's uh, book called Half Breed, you know, like it's a book that talks about child welfare and it talks about, um, you know, as a Métis road allowance woman being shipped from, uh, you know, foster home to foster home to foster home. Um, again, it, it's such an important story that I think crosses so many levels across this country when we divulge into such an important topic like, you know, in, in the TRC calls to action, Jordan's principle is is one mm -hmm. of the major calls to action around child welfare. And I think these type of books that we're seeing on residential schools, on rec this ties into child welfare is, is, you know, when we look at rates in our country of um, up to 70% of children in care are Indigenous, those are rates that should offend every Canadian. No. Right? Why is yeah. it this way? You know, we looking at 60 scoop, we start hearing about 60 scoop information and no one knows what that really was. There's, there's still a lot of lack of education around the 60 scoop and the 60 scoop was just to replace residential schools essentially, right? It's like, it's like the tough on crime legislation in the United States post-slavery. Mm -hmm. It's like now we're doing tough on crime policies, we're going to get all the segregated neighborhoods and put them in jail. Right. right, And it's the same kind of policies. We'll go into your community, we'll take your kids away because you're not able to parent. And so we saw a lot of our Métis families, road allowance, lose their children to child welfare, not because they weren't good parents, because their circumstances, via a number of uh, reasons, um, put them into a, a vulnerable situation. Yeah. And so, um, I think I went on a tangent there, but going, <laughs> <laughs> going back to the, the Common Book Project, I think that helps to, uh, to get young people talking about it. Right, that truth. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, and in a real way, right? You know, you're like, this is a real story. It's not a fake story. You're reading someone's true accounts and some brave person's true accounts. Because, yeah. um, you know, we had an opportunity in this country when the TRC um, 
when the TRC uh, came around and, and heard survivors' testimony. We had that in Lethbridge. I actually jigged at that event, uh, mm -hmm. and Theron Fleury was there to speak, and we right. had it here in Lethbridge, and anyone could go and listen to uh, survivors from Blackfoot Territory give their testimony about what happened mm -hmm. in the schools. I believe it was October maybe 2013 or 2014. It was in and around that time span. Right. And I was over at First Nations University when the TRC came there. So um, they held it at the First Nations University of Canada. And again, you could hear the survivor testimony. Right. It was hard to hear, but it was a real opportunity for Canadians to hear the real stories. And now it's published in a book about that thick right. that probably isn't going to gain as much traction as hearing it verbally. Right, yeah. So, you know, Canadians across the country really had that opportunity. It was there for them. So the Common Book Project, so you've got, you go into classes and, and um, that's one, one way that you've gone in is through the Common Book Project. Uh, other ways that you've kind of gone into classrooms and... Yeah, you know, every, a lot of it too is, um, so there would be a course content, like I'm going into, I've gone into Aboriginal Health Sciences to talk about Métis people in health, you know, and I've, right. and, and there's a lot, because in the grand scheme of talking about Indigenous studies in a main course content, say we get a week where all Indigenous content will be explored in a week. Right. And then the, and then the Métis story gets like a day. Right, and then that's when I would come in, is that day. <laughs> You're the day. <laughs> yeah, and I'd talk about, you know, Métis people and their history and their stories, and i try to get it, the high points in an, in a 50-minute or an hour-and-a-half lecture. Right. And maybe I'd do a dance with the group if they looked like they were interested in that kind of stuff. <laughs> right, yeah. But, but so, I mean, a number of cross-secs, um, that's where I would go in. But most, most commonly now, it was either to talk about reconciliation or it was to talk about the Common Book Project. Right. And now I think we're going to be, me and Charlene might be going into classes to talk about things like the importance of a territorial acknowledgement. Right. Right, because now yeah. that some uh, faculty members are going to be opening their course with this and having it on the syllabus, they're, they're going to want to explain, especially if you do an in-depth one, Right. Um, about some of the terms around uh, nationhood, around around geographical location, around these type of questions that are going to be very, you know, I think students will be interested and want to ask these questions. Like, you know, if a student comes and says, why do we do this? Right. Right? You know, and, and I, you would hope that the faculty member would be able to explain exactly why territorial acknowledgement is important. But And if they can, that's amazing. But if they can, it's good to preface the class that way to right. say, this is what we're doing and here's why. And so right. I think me and Charlie might uh, start doing a bit more of those type of dis right. quick discussions. Right. Yeah. And you've been working with some um, other types of initiatives with Sheila McManus. You've been yeah. working together. So what, do, what have you guys been working on? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, Dr. McManus came <laughs> up to me uh, and was saying, you know, we need to, because I think faculty members were getting stuck on the notion of indigenizing curriculum. Yeah. It, it became very complex, and, and I don't think a lot of people understood, well, what does that mean? What yeah. do I have to do to do I, that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was so confusing, and I get it. I mean, yeah. it, it is a complicated term. Uh, so we started talking, and we said maybe it was important to offer workshops through the teaching center, and even having snippets of best practice in the newsletter. You know, faculty members that have been doing this or hearing back from students that have heard it right. and, and seeing what success it is. Because I think once you start to see it successfully rolled out, yeah. I think that then other faculty members can be like, oh, okay, there's some templates or examples or best practices of how I can roll this out in my course content. And so we're working on delivering a series of of, uh, I wouldn't say lectures, more dialogues, but that are not so much centered on the notion of indigenization, but are really centered on how do we create um, a welcoming and inclusive classroom that is safe for all students to express themselves yeah. without fear of being objectified uh, to, you know, things that happen without our control, like the Colton Bushi case is a good example. Yeah. You know, if you come into a classroom and suddenly somebody says, hey, uh, what do you think about the Colton Bushi case? You're really an indigenous <laughs> like, student wow. in the class. Yeah. You're kind of like, uh, it's a pretty loaded question. You mean the jury selection? Do you mean the racist right. judge up there? Like, what, what, what portion do you want me to talk about? Yeah. The fact that an indigenous uh, kid was killed on a reserve in Saskatchewan? Like, and I think that, that that's some of the discussion we have to have is um, how do you 
maintain a classroom. I gave another example. I was meeting with a few professors yesterday on this very topic. You know, when I was young, 2003, I went into my criminal justice cor course, and the teacher goes, Roy, Métis have rights now. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> and I'm, I'm me and my one friend were the two Métis in the class, and I'm like, this just came out in the paper. Like, I, I, I didn't read through the court of case law yet. <laughs> you know, like, I was like, this is good. But then you look later on, and it's not so good. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, you, they have the Pauli case that, like, restricts Métis rights. And so at the time, yeah, we celebrate. Then, of course, a decade later, you start to see what the effect of that is. Right. Shrinking yeah. that constitutional box, right? And so I was just, I felt so... Like what? And then if I don't answer the question, I look like I'm incapable right. of providing a response on things that affect my own people. Whereas no other student would would have to stand up in front of the class and talk about a Canadian court case that was handed down. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which would which would be horrible unless you would just love that case and it was right. out yesterday and you knew it. <laughs> you followed it inside and out. <laughs> loved the case. Right. Just loved it. It was like you know I don't know. It was about like you know. Importing cigarettes across borders, and they handed down a Supreme Court decision. And you, you're very Canadian. You talk about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, it's like I, I guess it's good. Uh, you know, regional trade. I don't know. I don't know. But it was, it, and that was the example I used. And I think a lot of our uh, students uh, sometimes feel that way. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to. Um, we're trying to create that that opportunity for faculty members if they want to take advantage of it to to get past the term indigenization and start looking at what maybe some best practices of that are. Right, yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of um, people say, yeah, reconciliation is important, but I have no idea what to do about that, <laughs> right? And yeah. so that's yeah. a you know, a good stepping stone to... Yeah, and we want them, like, remove the term for a second. Yeah. It's really about just building those relationships and starting to yeah. to understand the history a bit more, right? And and I mean, I, I mean, maybe that sounds simple, and maybe I'm I'm undermining how complex this topic of discussion is. But I think a starting point is attending an event, right. going and 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 when you have an opportunity in Indigenous Awareness Days to learn. I mean, what's one hour? Yeah. You know, and and if you're far too busy and can't sacrifice one hour, there's always Google. Right. <laughs> Mm. We're afforded the luxury of Google. Not all is, is appropriate on it, but certainly you can find something in there. Right. <laughs> an academic article or something that pops up on Google. I think you've been working as well on a, an initiative through the School of Liberal Education um, on intercultural dialogue. Yeah, there was. Uh, so that's a course. That's course content that, that I think um, Dean Wismath and that committee that we're both a part of wants to implement. Right. Um, and I think it's more, yeah, about intercultural relationships. And I think what the initial term was, and this is kind of an outdated term, was uh, cultural competency. Right. And that's very outdated for a number of reasons. But I think the ultimate goal was that intercultural relationship development. How do you, how do you understand intersectionality? How do you understand you know, equal and equitable rights? How do you understand our social justice mechanisms that are in this country, the, the laws that are in place, the cases that have been done? I think that that was a large part of, of that discussion was we need a class that actually teaches these as hard skills rather than they've always been considered soft skills. Right. You know, so if you've learned social justice as a very abstract topic, what can that give you when you're done your degree? And I think the School of Liberal Education is really trying to make it a hard skill. Right. That when you come out of here, you understand intersectionality and how it plays a role in our everyday lives. You understand how that can inform policy. You understand how that does create um, relationships with people, is understanding right. that they're more than just the objectified appearance that they have. Right. Right, that there, there's so much more to them. And I think that that's the goal of that type of course, is to break down what we mean by identity. I think identity politics is very important. And I think right. when we go through our lives, you know, thinking about identity, thinking about even who we are, sometimes, you know, I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, I was at the, a meeting one time and I, you know, this one elder stops me and he goes to me, he goes, Roy, you know, you've traveled everywhere, you've done all these things, you know, you're, you're doing good. And he goes, but he goes, the hardest journey you'll ever take in your life is connecting your mind to your heart. Oh. 
right? right? And he says, once you've connected those two points, he says, well, everything will be fine, right? And he said, you can travel everywhere. That's what he was, you can go everywhere. You, you've been to many places, but until you connect that journey or make that journey, um, you're always going to have something challenging that'll come up. And I, and I took that advice to heart because it was really strong advice. And I think that's the same with identity is if we, as individuals, don't explore the intersectionality of our own identity, if we don't start to understand our own identity inside, then it's hard for us to understand other people's identity. And right. that, that goes along the binary of gender identity and everything. Right. We, we're going to struggle with that. Right. It's just occurring to me that we should talk about what, what do we mean when we're talking about intersectionality. I mean, intersectionality is really that, uh, that term that intersects all the points of our identity within an individual. So, you know, you know I use the example every day, especially in human rights law, when you're going to report a human rights case, they're going to ask you, well, what grounds um, did the discrimination happen? And, you know, a person could be um, an indigenous woman who is also a lesbian, who is also has a disability. All, all four of those important points are a part of their identity that makes them a unique individual. Yeah. And I think choosing one as an, as an outsider to focus on rather than the other three could, could be damaging in our friendship or relationship. That's um, always been challenging. Right. Because you can't know a lot of those. The only thing we know about someone is, is the assumptions we make about their objective criteria. Right. We can't know anything that's that they're not willing to divulge unless you build relationships. Right. Yeah. 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 And that and a lot of that has to do with power structures as well, right? So Absolutely. everybody's experience and connection to others and and there's always power structures involved in those things <laughs> um, are you yeah. know, based on all of those different parts of your identity. So Sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, within intersectionality comes the really challenging discussion of privilege, right? Yeah. So you talked about power dynamics and power structures. And this is one of the hardest discussions to have is around privilege yeah. because no one wants to admit that they've had a hand up. Not that no one's worked hard, everyone's worked hard to get where they got, but certainly no one wants to acknowledge this notion of, really, is there privilege in our society? Are some people more advantaged than others? And so I think that that plays a lot into the power dynamics. Yeah. You can see that even in politics, you can see that in law, you can see that in a number of other realms. Right. Um, but certainly uh, it's, it, it's one of the most difficult things to talk about. I think that would be covered in, in this type of liberal education course too. Yeah. Yeah, so there'd be some really interesting dialogue Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and really interesting. And I mean, the way that I always kind of think about, and I'm sure like this is only an aspect of, but what we've been talking about, but empathy, right, is yeah. one of those big things. And so for me, historically, I love, I, I teach and, and research three to 400 years ago um, in Europe and, and <laughs> my students are always you know, passing judgment on them. Why were they so ridiculous? And why were they so stupid about this? And why did they do that crazy thing, right? And <laughs> um, and I really want them to stop and say, get rid of all of those and try to understand that person for the context in which they lived, the experiences in which they had, and then try to understand why they're coming from it from that particular perspective. And so I think a lot of disciplines at the university can really help work towards this understanding. So intercultural dialogue is yeah. one aspect of that. And I think, you know, um, yeah. yeah. It, it's fascinating stuff to, to put in that context. I mean, it's funny too, because you have students saying, well, why did they do it this way back then? What will students say in 50, 60 yeah. years? Why do we do it these ways? Yeah, exactly. You know, especially they look at our current political climate <laughs> yeah. with our neighbors to you the only, south. You can only imagine what they will say in 50 years, right? About it, what we've done and what strange things they did. Sure. And even the clothes does, we wear. Yeah, why does, exactly. Why fashion trends were a certain way, you know, why, yeah. why decisions were made. It's very interesting. Yeah. No, so that's the, yeah, that, and I think that, that bodes w with exactly what we're talking about about learning from the past of what of what uh, how that impacts and influences today right exactly yeah how can yeah. how can we take those um, those lessons and begin to see how they've shaped who we are and yeah. how and who we are right now right so yeah yeah well yeah. one of what a, what a, a few of my elders have always taught me is that you know they taught things like being humble and, and practicing humility yeah. were big when I was growing up, like never, and I learned a lot of that in sports too, right? You, you, you know, and always my elders would say like, you know, you gotta be humble, you gotta practice humility, you gotta be respectful um, in everything you do, yeah. you know, in life. And I think that 
uh, with that comes that responsibility to reflect, you know. So a lot of them will say, well, reflect back to your journey. You know, think about the times that you failed. You don't fear, and you know, what I tell a lot of young people today is don't fear failure. You know, a lot of what we learn is because we took a chance to fail, you know, took a chance at something and failed. Right. And you know, a lot of young people will be, well, I'm too scared to, to do this or that. And I say, well, you know, um, you won't know success until you felt failure. You know, because what is one without the other, right? Because right. what is success yeah. if you've never failed? Yeah, right. For sure. So you don't know the bar or anything. So I, I, I tell a lot of uh, people, you know, it's okay to reflect. It's okay to go back and think about times where you could have done things better. And I think that's the same with what we're talking about history. Like I look at my ancestors. I wasn't a 23 year old in 1885 with a one year old kid fighting 1500 Northwest Mounted Police soldiers with right. 150 of my, <laughs> or 100 or 200 of my family. Right. right. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't in that. I'll never be in that situation. But one thing I can learn from it is the resiliency that my great great grandfather showed, the perseverance that he showed to, to truly believe uh, in fighting for his rights and for his family, and I can learn, you know, to to, to go for it, to to continue to fight, to continue to battle, and I can use that and harness that today. So there are lessons to be learned from from really understanding like our genealogy, our history, where we're coming from, and and that's what I'm grateful for is that I had the opportunity to learn that. Right. Yeah. And, you, and do you feel that you are able to? Does your job here and your ability to um, engage in teaching in a variety of different perspectives. I mean, you do it a whole bunch of different ways. <laughs> um, does that allow you to continue to do that? Yeah, I mean, it, it also cr creates a very strong connection to a lot of students. Like, you know, like I talk a lot about my Métis side because I'm in Canada and, and that's my upbringing was Métis Canadian. Right. But you know, my father's family moved here in the 50s from Germany because my grandfather never took dual citizenship, I'm a German citizen. So mm -hmm. I worked and studied in, in Austria and uh, Belgium with my German passport, right? right. So yeah. uh, there was a lot of sacrifices made on behalf of my other family as well. And I, I reflect on both. So I think like those type of things allow me to connect with a lot of students that are, because university is really a time where you start learning about your identity, who you are, who you want to be, you jump from degree to degree, you never quite know. <laughs> There's always those times where you get stuck and you're kind of like, should I do this? Is it worth it? You know, and I think that um, that allows me to connect with people. When, when you tell them your personal story, when you get real with them, I think that a lot of like students can connect to that because yeah. they're all looking for that, that next piece of identity that's going to, you know, create opportunities for them too, right? Right. Yeah. So I think my last question for you um, is going to be a question that I really love to ask my colleagues. And um, I've done this in a number of these interviews, not all of them, but many of them. Uh, when students, especially the students that you've taught and gotten to know, um, when they walk across that stage at convocation and they get their piece of paper, what lessons are you hoping that they will take from uh, your time with them, from their studies, and take into the world with them? From a mentorship perspective, you're always hoping that that some of the you know life experiences that you relayed to them, because a lot of our students in the Indigenous world are also mature students, right? Yes. So they're yeah. coming back to university to cross the stage to move in and get a better opportunity, um, you know, in their communities and so forth, or in our cities and, and what have you. So. The biggest uh, lessons that I, I want them to walk across with is confidence. Like, you did this. Uh, you you made it through. You were resilient enough to get to that end part. So you got to go into the next phase with, with confidence that you do you have obtained the ability to talk with anybody in relation to issues that matter. You know, and I think, and I always hope that students maintain a connection. You know, like the thing about us is we're great reference letter writers. <laughs> yes, right? we are. <laughs> we read a lot of them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, use that. Like, like if you're applying for a master's degree, if you're applying for a job, if you're applying for anything, like don't feel like our connection's done. You know, relationships are always ongoing. And I always hope that, you know, students that cross the stage who I'm very proud, proud of, I hope that they always stay connected because, you know, when you get older, you network and, and you have opportunities for people. And, and I think that staying connected is really important. Right. Yeah, that would be, those are the two things is I just think that confidence is everything. Right. 
That's a great, great note to end on. <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us today. It was a really interesting conversation and uh, took us in a whole lot of really interesting <laughs> directions. So very thought provoking. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Yeah, Mark. Thanks for having me, Janae. I appreciate it. Thank you. 